I should correct you when you say I've been doing good work. I, I work with the people doing the good work, um, and I, I have some influence over what they do every day. Um, so we have been evaluating the cure violence model here in New York for about three years now, um, four years. We started doing it with city funding, and then the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation came in and started up um, two brand new sites in neighborhoods that had not had a program before and wisely and amazingly um, mm -hmm. invited us to the table to talk about how to set those programs up so they could be evaluated. Um, and that was a very, it was an, an amazing meeting to me. Um, we had the foundation people there, and I don't know about you, but my experience with foundations is they love to give people money who make them look good, the foundations. Um, <laughs> So to sit in a room with them and say, well, we could evaluate this, but and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has really invested in the cure violence model. They believe in that model. And we were saying, if you want to evaluate it, you need to give us the resources and the freedom to really do a test of whether that model works. And then they had the people from Chicago, the cure violence headquarters, Gary Slutkin, come in, and we discussed this whole approach with them, and um, I was describing this as really a high-risk, high-reward model, because we, we were going to do the best job we could at sincerely testing the effectiveness of the model. And again, I was amazed when the cure violence people said, let's do it. It's time to do that, that we've done too many studies with just pre-post comparisons down in that neighborhood, down in this neighborhood. We really need to have a more controlled study. Um, which is amazing when they've invested their entire careers into promoting and developing this model to have someone who's not part of their crew to come in and say, well, let me objectively see if it makes a difference. So as soon as we started working on this, um, we looked into what cure violence meant, the heritage, what their theory of change was, um, and we, we worked with them. And I remember sending Chicago multiple versions. I think probably sent it to you too. Yeah this PowerPoint where we were saying, is this, is this a fair description of their conceptual model, their theoretical model? Because you have to articulate exactly how A causes B causes C causes D before you can just measure D and claim effectiveness. Um, and so one, one of the things we noticed right away was this norm change business that everybody knows that a little bit of authority sprinkled in with some help and support could change behavior. But the cure violence theory is you have to work on multiple um, angles at the same time. And the way you really change behavior is not finding the people engaged in violence now and making them stop. It's changing the way the community thinks about violence, which is the norm change component, which we heard about in the last panel. So we thought, well, if that's true, we have to try to measure norm change. So in addition to collecting administrative data about actual violence in the community, we've been doing these micro-targeted surveys in New York neighborhoods um, uh, for about, we've done like three complete waves now. We're, and we called Daniel and got some of his measures and we adapted some of them. So we'd send crews of people into the neighborhoods, mostly young people, um, with iPads and they stand and we do these, if anyone here is a researcher, we're using respondent-driven sampling which definitely has some drawbacks in terms of the validity of the sample, but it's a good way to get a very quick sample of a traditionally hard to reach, hard to recruit population. So we're, we're sampling 18 to 30 year old males in these neighborhoods, some of which have cure violence and some do not. And, we, and it's not a follow up longitudinal panel study where we go back and find the same people over time. Each wave we come in and do a brand new sample. So what we're doing essentially is measuring the prevalent social attitudes among 18 to 30 year old men in these neighborhoods and seeing if the trajectory of those norms about violence moves in a neighborhood that has cure violence versus one that doesn't. Now, I didn't bring a bunch of slides, um, but our we are posting things on our website as we go, and our website is John J R E C, which stands for Research and Evaluation Center, John J R E C dot N Y C. And if you go there and look for projects and look for cure violence, um, every time we post something, it will be there. So we're finding some of the same things. Um, I, I was surprised, maybe a lot of people here wouldn't be, when you ask a sample of 18 to 30 year old men in some of these neighborhoods, have you ever been shot at? You get 40, 50 percent saying yes. Now, shot at could mean I was once on a corner and shots were fired, but whether you were actually the target or not, they could be elaborating a little bit. Then we said, have you ever been stabbed? And the stabbing numbers usually come in in the 20s. So one out of five guys have been stabbed. Uh, then we ask about confidence in public institutions. Um, and you won't be shocked to know 
that when we, we ask this, the question, like, when, when violence breaks out in your neighborhood, would you trust the following? I think the phrase we use is to, to show up and help or something like that. Um, the police do not fare well in that question. Um, the strongest results we get are for fire and ambulance. Um, the two lowest responses are police and I think we use the phrase elected officials or public officials. They also do not have a lot of faith. Um, so then, then we're checking um, the outcomes over time and we're not just relying upon crime data. Um, one of the challenges in this field, and if you've ever done work in trying to measure changes in violence, it sounds easy at first, but there's no such thing as data about violence. We do not have data about the incidence of violence. We have data about proxy measures. So we have um, injuries, and we're using hospital data. Here in New York, there's a data set. We have data for everybody that shows up in an emergency room in a New York hospital for any reason. And then we have ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes, codes where we can determine whether it was due to a knife or a gun injury. So those are some of our outcome data. So we're following those over time. But those are injuries. It's not the same thing as crime because a lot of, in, a lot of violence happens and, and you probably know these stories too. People self-medicate, self self-treat, stay home, self-stitching. Um, and they don't want to go to the hospital for various reasons. So it's, not, it's a good proxy. It's a little better of a proxy than police data. Um, and if you've ever looked at the drop-off between the estimate for actual violence and then reported violence and then an arrested, making an arrest in, um, with an identified perpetrator, it's a vague um, uh, mirror or um, image of how much violence is in the community. So all we have are, we do have, we are collecting reported crimes. So we have reported um, shots, um, assaults, robberies with a weapon, um, and of course homicides. But all those things are mere that's a portion of all violence. But we're thinking that when we combine all these data, so we have police data on the incidence of reported crimes um, with specific mid-block coordinates, so we can really look at neighborhood level. And then we have the hospital data showing how many, and the, the patient data are coded on patient address. So we know that a person who lived on this block in Brooklyn had a gun injury on this date, and we can track that now for 20 years. So what we're doing is disentangling the incidence of violence um, based upon all that administrative data and measuring social norms to see if the changes in these incidents of violence um, comport with any movement in norms. Um, one little tidbit I'll give you at the end. Um, part of the reason, I know we hear this debate all the time. You mentioned hot places versus hot people. Um, we have a basic theoretical um, debates in the violence field um, is the way to stop violence to find out the people who are violent, identify them and control their behavior, or is the best way, as, as Daniel just said, we know that hot places tend to be the, the places that are incubating new hot people, so do you have to focus on the community level? And obviously you have to do both. Um, we wouldn't say we would combat a flu epidemic by just finding people with the flu we'd also try to teach people how to avoid getting the flu. So all these debates about whether the focused deterrence model is better than cure violence or are the police more effective than public health workers, it's, it's, I, I said to Daniel at lunch, we have to stop having these brand battles where my brand's better than yours. And we're all guilty of this. Um, and we all selectively, we're all professional cherry pickers when we're defending our brands. You know, we, and, and is anyone here from law enforcement? <laughs> oh, John, yes. Um, law enforcement professionals are very good at cherry picking indicators, um, and they do this all the time. And I just said at lunch, we have to teach police to stop using active verbs when they do this. And they always say, like, we reduced violence. And I'm always saying to them, can't you just say violence has decreased in the past five years? But they always want to claim it, that we reduced it. Um, they, so, they don't claim the increase. No, that's right, they don't claim the increase. <laughs> um, so there's all this, this fighting about who's responsible and who did this and who did that, and it's really unfortunate. A, a good friend of mine um, said something on Twitter a while ago, and I've tried to teach myself to always pause for a moment before I respond to a tweet, but I was, my fingers were on the keyboards, and I was just, because the, the, the comment on Twitter was, everyone would like to find a way to reduce violence um, without law enforcement, but no one's ever figured out how to do that. And I thought, come on. Like we, 
it's called the suburbs. It, you, you have a community with nice lawns and good schools and attentive parenting and activities and no one gets bitten by rats at night. They, they don't need as much policing. Like how do we, how do we get away from thinking that um, the violent programs, the way to stop violence is first to go to where all the violence is intense and figure out how to stop it. Can't we learn lessons from the broader world? And we know healthy communities, healthy families, and, and um, perceptions of safety and all those things will lead to fewer hot people and less retaliations. So you have to do both. You have to focus on all the tools at your disposal. And the trick is to, to measure it well enough and thorough enough that we could start competing because it's it'd be nice if we could sustain programs by having good concepts and passionate defenses. But those days are over um, because it, you, can, you can score some points politically for a while um, being good promoters for your model. But at some point, someone's going to say, yeah, put up or shut up. What are your numbers? Can you prove this? And it's not just pre-post changes. You have to be able to show that your intervention was correlated with the cause in a way that's reliable and replicable. And that's really hard to do with violence. So one of the dangers I see in the field um, and I forget who made the comment before about random assignment studies and experimental designs, but I totally agree with that, that if we hold up experimental designs as the, the essence and only acceptable sort of evidence for public policy, we are ex essentially excluding any model which is not delivered at the level of individuals because you cannot, we don't have the money. You, theoretically, you could do random assignment on communities and blocks, and, but no one has those kind of resources. So if, if we say an experimental design is the only evidence you can have, then the only studies we will ever um, have that shape policy are things where we, in, we try to change the behavior of single people at a time. And that, is a, that can work, and it's definitely part of the toolbox, but unless we focus on the structural and social context of all those individual behaviors, we will not really solve this problem. So we have to accept um, evidence that's not just experimental, but that does not mean you just open up the doors and let anything in. Um, whenever I visit a city and I have to get in a taxi cab and they say, what are you doing here? I've learned not to answer honestly because <laughs> then I get all the homespun remedies for violence and everyone's got one. So you can't say experimental designs are not the only um, type of evidence. So any kind of evidence you got, bring it on in. We have to have some standards, but it has to be set at a level that's not exclusively experimental.